Thank you, Paula, and thanks to uh, Boaventura Sosa Santos and the team of Alice for their um, generous invitation to come here and partake of this uh, dialogue uh, in these three days, this conversation south-south, north-south, south-north. I have, I want to make a number of 10 inter, short interrelated points. And in order for you maybe to understand them better, I, w I would like to preface them by noting two things. First, um, these 10 points in a way can be understood uh, in relation to two of the networks in which I participate, have been active for more than 10 years, uh, more than 15 years now, both of them. One is the Modernity, Coloniality, Decoloniality uh, Network, and the other one is the network of the Caribbean Philosophical Association. Both are largely South-South, South-North, and North-South uh, projects of engagements in the Americas mainly, but not only. And um, the second is that also these reflections um, relate to a long project which I, in which I have been trying to flesh out a um, couple of fundamental ideas. And one of them is that at the heart of coloniality, there is a paradigm of war, W-A-R, and that ultimately decoloniality is a form of love against war. It's a very uh, classical, if not perennial themes that I, I think relate uh, quite directly to the struggles that uh, we often talk about in North and South and South North and South South dialogues. Um, and sometimes I think we let go of those quote unquote, and I know that there is a danger of extending too much of this vocabulary about perennial themes, but these major themes um, that sometimes we sort of privilege um, momentary analysis, which are completely necessary, but perhaps sometimes lose sight of these fundamental areas that are undergirding, that are sort of on, underneath these kind of affairs, and that uncovering that help us in the description and the action. So we can combine theory, description, and action. And that's part of, of what the work is about. And this, I have found, this connection between coloniality and war and decoloniality and love. In, I have found it in a number of Caribbean writers, uh, particularly in the work of Francis Fanon. And in a way, I approach the Caribbean as a zone of, that was, have received uh, waves of different forms of coloniality uh, throughout since 1492 to today, the multiple empires, multiple uh, subjects of empire in the Caribbean. And also as this incredible zone of conflict, divided zone of conflict, very fragmented. Um, but it is in that very space also that the realization of the coloniality of love is also very clear. Right? And you can see actually some of that, those for you who uh, work following contemporary literature in the work of Juno Diaz, for example, um, Dominican uh, US uh, writer, writes about uh, uh, many things, but including totalitarianism, the, the sort of the, the, the experience of dictatorship in the Dominican Republic and the effects on Dominican subjects, but also this at the heart of that experience, the desire to have uh, intersubjective relations. Um, which can be understood as love. So I begin. First point, the Caribbean, um, I'm looking at the Caribbean as an early laboratory of an emerging modern colonial world order or civilization. It is a place where indigenous peoples were to a great extent decimated and where black slaves from Africa were introduced to work on plantations, extracted, you know, the Middle Passage. The early contact led to, a to that early contact, led to a reality where behaviors that usually took place in war became part of the fabric of new world societies. Because, this is the second point, because war is naturalized in that context, it does not need a, any special justification. 
It is as if the world admits, or rather demands, a behavior that was usually found in wars in previous times before uh, the so-called discovery of the Americas and uh, the colonization of the so-called New World. This means that war becomes part of the ordinary common sense of the citizen subjects of this new world order. With this, war as a modality or as an attitude is installed in the subjectivity of the emerging normative subject. This quote-unquote attitude of war will be at work in the expansion of European empires and the decimation of peoples, languages, and knowledge, knowledges that took place in that expansion over the several centuries. The attitude of war in the way that I have described it, he, that, that I have described it, is therefore at the heart of colonialism. In fact, the attitude of war is an intrinsic element in the attitude of colonialism or a colonial attitude. And I have worked on this before. Number three, when we speak about human rights, we speak about rights that belong to, the, to human beings qua human beings. But part of what the modern colonial world order, this world order dominated by a paradigm of war that I've talked about, part of what this modern colonial world order with its warring, warring and colonial normative attitudes produced was a sense of social order based on degrees of humanity. In some cases, at the ordinary level where the colonial attitude operates, Certain beings, for instance, indigenous and black subjects, were seen at most as, as human-like animals and not as full-fledged human beings properly. The issue here is that if you don't perceive the humanity of a being, then you will not see human rights being relevant with respect to such subjects. This means that uh, Something like philosophical anthropology becomes key in the understanding of the possibilities and limits of human rights discourse, perhaps as a propedeutics to human rights discourse proper. Um, that is, for human rights to work, we need a concept of the human being that can effectively overcome the limits of the modern colonial world order and its warring and colonial attitudes. That is, before we begin to count injuries or identify excesses, we have to contend with quote unquote, the fact of dehumanization, and with ideas that have led to the illusion of the naturalization of this state. And just a parenthesis here, when I talked, instead of exploring this idea of the fact of dehumanization, when I talked about it, I am in a critical dialogue with uh, liberal theorists who focus on the fact of what they call the fact of pluralism. And the fact of pluralism refers to the irre irreducible existence of a variety of views about the good and the true in modern societies. It takes this idea about the fact of pluralism that we must contend with. It takes its point of departure in the wars of religion of, in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. But the wars of religion occur in the backdrop of the production of the fact of dehumanization that was occurring in the Americas since 1492 and in other parts of the Iberian Peninsula before that. Then when we talk about the fact of pluralism, think about John Rawls, for example, we often forget that the substantive good of the views in question, of, of these plural views in society, are not simply a plural set of irreducible ideas, but that they exist and partly respond to the coloniality of power, knowledge, and being we form here the three pillars of the fact of dehumanization in Western modernity. What I'm talking about is thinking about doing political theory by starting or taking as more fundamental the fact of dehumanization, the fact of dehumanization like undergirding at the base of any such fact of pluralism. Um, and the fact of pluralism itself, by beginning with that, it, it can easily hide the complexity and the reality of the fact of dehumanization because it reduces power relations to differences in knowledge or base. The fact of dehumanization for is hardly sustained on the basis of explicit denials of the humanity of beings that appear to be human. 
That is, when we observe as modern human subjects, modern Western human subjects, we tell ourselves, we may tell ourselves that we are seeing human beings, but what we are really seeing are bodies that appear to be human. That's how, in fact, the, the grammar of thinking operates. Humanity as such is conferred, or the epistemology of the process. Humanity as such is conferred in proportion to the attributes of that to the attributes given to that body and to its actions. If it is male, if it is white, if it speaks well, that is without an ethnic accent, uh, if it works and so on, then actual humanity begins to be considered, sometimes never completely, can easily take away. And that's it, it's the process of, of conceding humanity and denying humanity. That's uh, as part of an inner part of the very perceptual um, ordinary operations of human beings cultivated in the modern episteme, modern colonial episteme. When we see others, we don't see cultural or ethnic differences only, but also ontological and subontological differences. Differences between being and beings, and between beings in the zone of being and beings in the zone of non-being. That's the map that we begin to create, our perceptual map. This means that the, the humanization is, among other things, an action, it's a process, it's an operation, it's an exercise that modern subjects do as part of the way in which they make sense and constitute the meaning of the world. And part of my question is, well, what is the challenge that this represents to human rights discourse? The fact that as modern human uh, citizen subjects, we operate with that perceptual feel, which is not about recognizing humanity overall. Here, what Ventura de Sosa and Santos' work is, an important, is important in that it helps us to understand the way in which the absence of humanity takes place. Think about what he talked earlier, the different modes of producing absence and the different modes of those absences, like um, the inferior subject, the ignorant, the local, and so on. So the sociology of absences actually in that way precedes and should precede any attempt at using human rights discourse in a way that can, so that it can escape its limits and not be innocent. Uh, and this is actually how it, it appears in his book, Decolonizing Knowledge of Inventing Power, where the first part of the book is precisely about uh, the uh, sociology of absences and emergences. And, and then in the second part is that he begins to talk about human rights. And I don't know if was, how intentional was it, but I think that ultimately that I also propose in something very much along those lines. One kind of reflection as necessary propadeutic to the, a, a kind of really decolonial use of human rights. Now, if we go to the Caribbean again, we find the proposal of a, for the sociology, as well as the philosophy and psychology of absences and, and emergences, I think also, in the work of Franz Fanon. Fanon's work, in fact, begins with an asser assertion of what I have called the fact of dehumanization. That's why that text is so fundamental in illuminating that fact of dehumanization and how central it is for, to understand the modern experience. Um, he wrote, at the risk, and this is in the introduction of Black Skin, White Mass, at the risk of arousing the resentment of my color brothers and sisters, I would say that the black is not a human being. That's it. Fanon, at the outset of his work, tells us that he's inaugurating a form of reflection about forms of denying things in their being. Now, when human rights are alluded to by Fanon, he suggests that quick references to human rights hide the most basic that in a, in a modern anti-black world, blacks do not appear as human beings. It sort of hides that instead of confronting it. Things are so drastic that black subjects themselves incorporate that view and, and live a life negating themselves. No, of course, not all of blacks, but he says it's what the system instill in black subjects to deny themselves, to, in a way, uh, uh, live against their own being. When a person of color fights modernity coloniality, then, or oppose it through the language of human rights, it presents us with a fundamental paradox. And the paradox is this. Here we have a being that is not fully seen as a human being herself or himself, and yet is claiming or defending human rights. The question is how to make this paradox an unsettling one and a productive one as well. Here is when the concept of attitude becomes important again. Remember the warring attitude and the colonial attitude? 
Point six, if the modern colonial world sustains the fact of dehumanization through the normalization of a particularly radical warring and colonial attitude, an attitude that leads to the production of multiple absences, then the overcoming of modernity coloniality necessitates the emergence and continuation of a different kind of attitude. I have referred to this in various places as the decolonial attitude. What do I mean by this attitude and why is it helpful for the use of human rights discourse? Firstly, the decolonial attitude is not the same as an anti-colonial anti ideology. That's what, that is not what I'm saying when I'm saying decolonial attitude. I'm not saying anti-colonial ideology. It is not simply about the opposition to colonialism as a practice. The decolonial attitude is rather a radical position against the fact of dehumanization itself. Remember that I'm trying to define coloniality in relation to the fact of dehumanization and not simply as an enterprise of political or economic takeover of one territory over the other. This means that it is about two things. The decolonial attitude. First, it is about the identification of the multiple ways in which dehumanization, dehumanization is produced. And second, it is about the effort to create strategies and alliances to subvert dehumanization. It is about, as Maria Lugones puts it, and Yomaira Figueroa further elaborates, it is about faithful witnessing and about, as Sheila Sandoval points out, the colonial love. You will note, note here that these tasks, one, the identification of the multiple ways in which dehumanization is produced, and second, the effort of creating strategies and alliances to subvert dehumanization, to act, to emerge, can be linked to uh, Santos's call for the sociology of absence and a sociology of emergences. This means that his own sociology and critical theory, I think, can be seen as part of a will to faithfully witness, on the one hand, witness these absences, the production of the absences, and to love decolonially, that is, looking for the emergences. If so, it is best understood in relation to the formation and expression of the decolonial attitude. These different pieces, eight, getting there, the decolonial attitude, faithful witnessing, decolonial love, the sociology of absences, the sociology of emergences, and we can add the analysis of the monoculture of knowledge and the ecology of knowledges are part of what we can call also following Chela Sandoval, a methodology of the oppressed. Nine, Sando Sandoval's methodology of the oppressed has the decolonial attitude, I would argue, at its heart in what she calls, what she calls, and I quote here, differential consciousness. Guided, she says, this consciousness, I cannot explain too much because of the limits of time, by the ethical principle of equality. On the one hand, democratics, she calls it, and that's where we can relate human rights. And on the other one, decolonial love. Human rights discourse is part of the ethical principle of equality in, in, in this work, and therefore has a place within the methodology of the praise of the oppressed. However, human rights discourse is only one among other ways of searching for social equality and equal rights. For Sandoval, the decolonial subject has to be able to shift perspectives and discourses to avoid the problem of having human rights discourse or, or other liberation discourses hinder the efforts of decoloniality. It has always to be flexible. That's why differential consciousness is ultimately about. So it's not about the reification of any one discourse. And then, facing what I have called the fact of dehumanization, human rights discourse has a space in the effort of decoloniality as an act of constant vigilance, vigilance and of faithful witnessing. And what I'm trying to do is, in a way, to look at that what, that what we call human rights in a way differently, or in relation to other set of ideas so that we can begin to see other, perhaps, potential, or perhaps other uses. Affirming, aiming to bring to light any space where inequality is produced. So human rights discourse as a form of faithful witnessing and as part of a methodology of the press. The paradoxical condition of the person of color who uses human rights discourse is overcome the paradox itself is overcome by the notion that one does not presuppose one's humanity when one speaks about um, 
human rights. That is not, ha that is not what happens when one f is or performs faithful witnessing. But rather, once humanity is affirmed, is affirmed in the very act of witnessing faithfully, the most in which others and oneself are dehumanized. This means that humanity does not consist in an essence or a particular set of attributes. I remember at the beginning I said that we needed to do some philosophical anthropology, that we needed to redefine what the human was in this process. So I think that at the end we get to, the, to a point, to a hint about how we can reformulate the idea of the human. So it's not an essence, not a particular set of attributes, and this is connected to how we understand human rights. Because then, if humanity is not an essence or a particular set of attributes, human rights cannot be seen as the features that belong to a thing, as height belongs to this, for example. It has to be understood in a completely different way. But rather, once humanity is appearing in the very act of, of faithful witnesses, this means that humanity does not consist in this essence, but in an act of approaching others an act of witnessing without imposition, an act of love. But loving, the colonially speaking, means being committed to, as Fanon put it, ending the world, as we know it. In that sense, human rights discourse, the sociology of absences and emergences, and even the methodology of the oppressed itself, are not only epistemic, but are also ethical and political acts. They are forms in which we counteract the fact of dehumanization, and its constitutive coloniality of knowledge, power, and being. The way that we counteract this with radical, fearless, truly humane ways, truly humane ways of thinking, doing, and being. And that's how we can then use human rights discourse in a decolonial way. Thanks. <laughs>